some of my collaborators, and in Brazil and abroad, and today's uh, talk will be, will be related to the work of John Fu, from postdoc, Poliana, and Marco, two of my for, former PhD students, and uh, then I was in Basel and uh, Sibiru Ellison in, um, in Reykjavik. Uh, so this is a brief outline. I will start by telling you a little bit about this bit more interaction. Uh, and uh, towards the end of my talk, I'll focus a little bit on topological project insulators. Um, so this is some related work. Uh, for those of you who are interested in other topics, like spin polarization, <laughs> graphene, ballistic spin resonance, meet anti-localization, I'll mention this work because it's related to, to, to the topic I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, but the main focus will be, no, main focus will be a two sub-band quantum map. That's the main ingredient for this talk. That's it, it is the ingredient that it allow me it will allow me to to uh, come up with the uh, schema lattice in a non-interactive system and also some topological insulating behavior in uh, in our electron quantum map. Um, so uh, we've heard many times during uh, this week. Uh, about the spin orbit interaction, it has been uh, gained some renewed interest in, uh, in the recent years because of topological insulators that it plays a role, because of the spin locking, the protected states, the experimental realization there. And of course, there's the Majorella physics where you combine semiconductors, proximity, <coughs> yeah, superconductivity, and, uh, and also the spin orbit interaction uh, in wires. Uh, and this is right now classical result where. Um, uh, you know, the Delft experiment, and also because of this, uh, the possibility to generate, uh, you know, synthetically, uh, spin orbit interaction in cold atoms. This is something we also work on. So let me just briefly review the spin orbit interaction. So this is the usual atomic physics argument where you have an electron and an atom, and then you sit on the electron, and you, uh, you feel the electron has uh, the uh, spin, and it feels an effective uh, magnetic field, Due to the, the nuclei in its reference frame, and of course, the classical you know, energy is just given by that mu dot b, which then turns out to be the spin orbit interaction. And I write the, the corresponding Hamiltonian. That's the usual LS coupling in an atom. Right? In, a, in an atom, you have a certain, you know, kind of central potential, so that's the usual uh, form of the spin orbit interaction. I can go through the same type of argument. Uh, in a two-dimensional electron gas at an interface, go to the uh, reference frame of the electron. The only difference, is the essential difference, is that uh, the potential is now uh, the gradient of the potential along the z direction. So the electric field is perpendicular to this interface, and uh, that brings in a nice feature, which is the fact that you can control, in principle, the spin orbit interaction. If I define an alpha constant to be, say, some kind of expectation value of um, slope of this potential, then in principle you can tune it by a gate. That's a big difference between the atomic physics and the, the spin orbit in a, in, a, in a heterostructure. That's the so-called Rajba spin orbit interaction, and it, you can use this to manipulate, rotate, and, and, uh, and so on, uh, in a vacuum spin. Uh, of course, this picture I just described is very approximate. It's actually wrong if you look at it very carefully. You have to do more to uh, actually get this alpha constant, uh, and one way to do it is via the, the usual k dot p Hamiltonian. And uh, so, if you have, uh, you start with the quantum mile like this, the, the usual gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide quantum mile, we have you know, the usual potential for the electrons here. There's an offset, delta C, uh, you know, the gap uh, in the well region. There's also the band gap <coughs> in, the, in the barrier region, and you can define all this quantities. Uh, the offset for the light pole band, the offsets for the split off band, and the usual three five six. These are all parameters that you take uh, from experiments for you. So it's a phenomenological problem. This function is, I call it the profile function. It's going to be important uh, along the way as well. So this is just representing the, the square uh, uh, well here. Now, if you do the standard k dot p uh, theory, this is like the Kane, the so-called Kane Hamilton, the most, uh, the, the simplest version of it. You can see there's a lot of zeros here in this uh, whole sector. It actually does not really describe well the curvature of the heavy holes, but we don't really care about that because we're, we're going to be focusing on 
on the electron sector. So you're going to eliminate, you're going to do some kind of triple growth transformation, unitary transformation to eliminate this block here because the, this whole block is coupled to the electron bar via the k.p dot p terms, p dot p blocks here. And uh, I have in addition along the diagonal here this potential, which are uh, potential wells. In, in my case, this could be anything. I mean, purity is eventually it's going to be just the potential profile, but it could be anything. Um, uh, so it's defined down there in terms of the parameters that I defined in the previous slides. So what I do next is uh, this Hamiltonian, it has this form, right? So I have the electron sector, the whole sector, and I can easily uh, write two sets of equations, linear algebra, substitute one into the, into the other, and then <coughs> eventually isolate, so I do three and two, and I get an effective two by two Hamiltonian. So in our case, this is two by two, this is six by six. So I eliminate the HQ subspace, and I end up with uh, a uh, Hamiltonian, which has the original two by two electron Hamiltonian, plus some term that I call V effective here, which describes the coupling between the electron sector and the whole sector. That's actually the physical origin, if you want to think about it, of the uh, spin orbit interaction. So I now have a, a uh, two by two block, which is filling the effects of the, you know, the heavy and light holes and the split off holes in an effective way, and this, of course, it has spin and momentum coupled, so that's the spin orbit traction. Uh, of course, this is not really a Schrodinger equation because you have an, an absolute that, so that's the energy, the eigenenergy of the system, right? If you do things properly, and I'm not showing the full story here, you actually have to renormalize the wave function because there's a normalization. So the integral of psi has to be one, psi squared, and of course, there's a coupling between phi p and phi q. If you account for that, and you do some expansion to uh, you know, lowest order in, uh, in, the, in the energy gap, uh, this actually goes away and you get a true Schrodinger equation without any uh, effective Schrodinger equation. Just to illustrate this procedure, in our case, here's again the k dot p 8 by 8 Hamiltonian written in some compact form. You find some T matrix here. So this is the, uh, the 6 by 6 whole sector, same as I had before. If I diagonalize this in bulk, I get the usual beds. I can see the heavy holes has a wrong curvature here that I don't, doesn't matter for me. Um, and I can just apply this procedure, and I get some kind of effective Pauli equation. I can actually do this with the magnetic, then it would be the true Pauli equation. And you can see that I get all these terms, the kinetic energy term, k squared. This would be the origin of the effective mass in the system. So I start with the bare effective mass, and I get this term here, which is actually the inverse of this is much bigger than that. That would be the, uh, the effective mass of the gallium arsenide. It's not uh, completely right because you have to add other bands to get the proper band the mass. But the important terms for me here are the, uh, the red terms, and those represent the spin orbit interaction, which is nicely written here in, in terms of three contributions, which I call the Hartree contributions, <clears throat> the gate plus doping, and uh, the well. Uh, contribution. So it's essentially, I call it the well because this is the offset I mentioned to you before, the square potential. This is the gate plus doping. So I have one well, I can dope it on both sides or, or not dope. Or, and then I, in addition to that, I can have a gate that can tilt the system. So, uh, and here is the Hartree potential. You know, I can, this is the electron electron interaction in the mean field fashion. They all depend, as you can see, that all this, this term depend on the derivative of the potential. So all these alphas are some kind of derivatives or graded to the potential uh, of the well. This is the same procedure we do, uh, we perform to go from the Dirac to the Pauli equation. Again, you can do the magnetic field, I didn't do it for simplicity here, but you can apply the same procedure to the Dirac equation and you can derive the usual spin orbit interaction, uh, as you can see here. So the Dirac equation plus some external potential, and you get the same. So this is the um, you know, analogous equation that they want to just show you. The last term um, uh, in this uh, equation here, yeah, I'm writing now in a more compact form, so I define this alpha as the three contributions that I just mentioned to you before. This last term is related to the Darwin term, it's not spin dependent, I'm just going to drop it, it's very small, it's just a shift, you can do it, you know, improve it easily as well. But for the purpose of this talk, I just uh, neglect that. So at the end of the day, then I go from an 8 by 8 description to a 2 by 2 uh, Hamiltonian with effective uh, with an effective alpha uh, coupling, the spin orbit 
company, which I defined previously. And I get out, go on and try to solve this equation. So uh, this is still a 3D problem. So they have X, Y, and Z. So now I have this profile of the well. The well is infinite in 2D, in the X, Y plane. So I imagine I have a solution which is kind of like plane wave, in plane, and then uh, confined in the Z direction. So one way to treat this, of course I can easily solve this, it's a couple of set of equations, you can easily solve it, um, um, but I would do it in a more uh, intuitive way, which is I would, for instance, neglect that, and then I'll solve the ordinary quantum mal problem. I can find the wave functions, the lowest, uh, the first uh, confined state there, and then I go back and I project you know, this Hamiltonian onto this uh, subspace. So I just take the expectation value of this alpha, then I construct then a uh, two-dimensional uh, version of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, which is valid in this low energy sector here. So now this alpha is just the expectation value of these two quantities here, which are described as the derivative of those, you know, these three potentials. And of course, these constants here are related to the uh, to the bulk parameters of uh, of, uh, the, of the, the the bulk system, like the gap, the K matrix element, the usual K matrix element, and so on. So I have three contributions that, in principle, I can I can calculate. Now, I can do the same thing, and this is the important part for our talk because this is all old stuff. Uh, I can do the same thing with two subbands now. Now, if I, I go through the same procedure. I uh, can solve the problem in you know, neglecting the, uh, the off-diagonal terms, and then I project. Uh, but now I consider two states. So in this case, I get a 4 by 4 Hamiltonian. So I have a sector in which I have uh, the, uh, the Reichbach interaction for the first subband, the Reichbach alpha 2 interaction for the second subband, and in addition, I have this eta term, which is the inter subband coupling. <laughs> Now, here's the definition, as, you know, as, as I showed you before, of the alpha 1 and alpha 2. So they depend on the gap and the K matrix element and the offsets of the valence uh, band and also the derivative of the profile function of the well, so the square. Uh, and here, this V is essentially the heart tree plus the gate plus everything that is electrical, in, if you, you know, in, in this sense. Um, we also have the eta. And this is an interesting point here that uh, usually, if you have a symmetric well, we all know that the Reichbach interaction is zero, and you can see it's zero because for a symmetric well, by, by, by parity, you get zero. Here. This is an, you know, an, an odd function, and these are two even functions that the whole thing is zero. However, if you have an inter subband coupling, uh, uh, this quantity is actually proportional to matrix elements that connect the first and the second subband. So this can be uh, non zero even in a uh, symmetric problem. Now, just to validate our approach, I'm just going to flash this slide, which is a, a nice experimental work combined with the simulation that my, my, my former postdoc, John Koo, uh, in collaboration with uh, Dominic Sungul from the University of Basel and, and, and David Doshler from Chicago, <laughs> where uh, uh, in Dominic's group, they uh, perform weak localization, make mental and localization measurements to identify this uh, so-called alpha equals beta condition, the, uh, which I'm going to mention in br in br briefly uh, later on. Uh, so you do weak localization, mental localization measurement, and you can identify uh, from uh, these measurements a, a, uh, a region in primary space where the Reichbach and the Dresshaus coupling constants are equal because you go from weak mental localization to weak uh, localization. Now we perform simulations along the lines I just described for this alpha self-consistent uh, uh, simulation, then, uh, and we can also identify, calculate the alphas and beta, and also the several contributions like the well, the heart with the gate was open, and, uh, and this all is very consistent with uh, with, uh, with the experimental results. And one important thing of this uh, work is that for the first time, experimentally, the, you know. It was found that it's possible to tune, sort of dynamically, the alpha and beta constants. Meaning that you can change the density, so you have a back and a top gate on the system, and you can change both in a way that alpha and beta are locked. So, and this is very important for what I'm going to talk next. Um, uh, you know, 
which is this so-called persistent spin helix. So, um, so this approach is uh, validated uh, by this kind of um, this more compact form. You can diagonalize it and you find this too. Uh, so there are two actually Dirac points. The, the eta is splits this crossing of the band, and you have two Dirac points because it's a two subband system. Um, you can generalize this to include, you know, the dress of ours and the rise by the eta subband. So this is the more generic Hamilton, and we have expression in the in the supplementary material to this paper for all these um, uh, uh, constants, and uh, we do some self-consistent calculation to determine. Uh, to determine all of them. So this is 4 by 4 Hamiltonian just do not fit it here. And this is what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use this kind of Hamiltonian now to, uh, to talk about this persistent spin here. Now just to, uh, as an aside, people have studied this in some in sort of ferromagnetic system like bismuth, silver uh, type structures, and where they actually see this kind of band splitting, they call it that, of course there in this kind of this flipping around so they can see Looks the same, but it, it, you know, just showing this to flat, uh, flashing this, just to show it's it's uh, related to, uh, to the, the kind of splitting that I'm talking about in a completely different system where they, you know, the man, the order of magnitude is much larger. The delta they can uh, tune this delta via the number of layers in the system. Alpha is in delta are much bigger than the, the usual semiconductors. Uh, now, what do we do with this and uh, with this uh, Rajma dress box? Let me. Uh, the, Go back and you've seen this before. Besides the rivalry interaction, I also have the spin, you know, the, the dress all spin off interaction. So here's the general uh, Hamiltonian where I also add some disordered potential there, non magnetic. And uh, we studied this a couple of years ago, and it, you know, it's shown that you know, if you have this so called symmetry condition, because you can tune alpha, alpha is tunable by a gate. In principle, for alpha equals beta, there is some kind of partial cancellation of these two terms, and you can see that the the, the Hamiltonian factorizes in the p and mm -hmm. sigma. And in fact, you can show that this new, uh, if I call this capital sigma, this is actually a conserved quantity in the system. Um, and of course, if I write down the Hamiltonian, I can immediately solve it formally. Uh, and there is an interesting uh, uh, fig, you know, feature here, which is the fact that the spinner is k independent. So notice that this is not a plane wave solution. You know, this is phi here. Phi is the orbital part which obeys this um, uh, Schrödinger equation in it here, in principle, in the interest of disorder. Uh, of course, we are considering uh, the case in which have like weak disorder. This is like almost a plane wave, if you want. But the important part is that it's uh, a spinner. Uh, this spinner is independent. So that's, hence, it's going to be immune to the scattering, to the lowest order. Uh, and, you know, the semiconductor is linear in K, so you know, it's immune to this order. Of course, if I include cubic terms, that would be, um, and we've done that, people have done this, studied this extensively, of course, then uh, the spin would be K. Now, <coughs> can rotate the semiconductor just to write it in terms of uh, rotate it to this axis, you know, the axis direction here, and uh, write this in terms of the same <coughs> effective field. And this is more, um, you know, clear. it's clear if you look at this Hamiltonian that I can tune alpha to beta, then the effective field would be pointing along the y direction, like shown here. And if I, uh, in this case, it's a unidirectional field, so the, like, it's just another view of what I just showed you. And uh, in this case, it would suppress also the diagonal and the effect type mechanism. The same thing if I have alpha equals minus beta, uh, and so on. Now, um, to, uh, understand why what, what this persistent spin helix that I'm going to be talking about later on is, I just rewrite here the Hamiltonian uh, uh, that I just showed you uh, for this particular direction. Uh, in this particular you know, uh, reference frame, I can write this as a, an effective magnetic field. And the effective magnetic field for alpha equals beta is point, it's, it's you know, p-dependent, and it's pointing along the y direction. Right? So, the system is two-dimensional, but effectively, this uh, uh, spin-over interaction is one-dimensional. So this is the, the bottom line here. Now, I can immediately exponentiate this and calculate the, uh, the uh, time evolution, if you want, due to this perturbation. And I can uh, do it some minor, just using that uh, 
uh, x is v times t, I can go from here to here, where uh, I define this capital Q1 vector, which is uh, the so-called, uh, um, it's going to be the, quote, the pitch of this helix, as that we'll mention later. But it's related to the, to the alpha 1 equals beta 1. I'm calling it now alpha 1 beta 1 because I only have one subband in this case I'm showing you. Now you can immediately see that if I operate with this uh, operator here, uh, on the one zero state, say spin up, it will evolve into that. And this I'm doing a very sim sim simplistic you know, approach here, I'm just, you know, thinking of in terms of a ballistic you know, plane wave system. Uh, and, uh, and if I do this, I can immediately calculate the spin density and I can show it's like this. So this is, uh, you know, this is the so-called persistent spin helix and this does not decay to this order. It's just uh, the disorder of the Hamiltonian. So it's, it's just going to be like that. If I generate a, a, um, a, a spin density that it looks like this, uh, it would remain um, uh, so for a long time. Now, this actually has been you know, formalized you know, after, um, a couple of years after that, you know, our early publication. Uh, Bernevig, Ornstein, and Chu Zheng actually came up with a nice formal way to, um, to define what they call SU2 uh, spin operators, you know, that define you know, like a helical pattern, showing that this uh, actually commutes with the Hamiltonian of the Rajvadrasohaus Hamiltonian system. And then hence, it's a conserved quantity. And uh, it's robust against uh, you know, disorder, as I said, and even you know, against um, electron lag interactions. Just show that this, uh, these operators commute to the Hamiltonian in the presence of all this disorder, or you know, to like um, except you, know, you have to preserve the inverse symmetry. And interestingly, just recently, uh, <clears throat> there was an on ONMAT, the generalization of this argument. Um, for other directions. That's a former collaborator of mine, John Schliemann, his students. Uh, so they now generalize this PSA condition to other crystal directions, several of them. Um, and of course, then you can make a plot of the, the density I just showed you before. It looks like this. So this is a, like a spin density wave. This picture is slightly misleading because uh, that, that the, it doesn't imply that, you know, that one electron is going along one direction rotate. The electron actually, the orbital motion is scattering all over the place because the system is 2D, but the spin, you know, from the standpoint of the spin, it's 1D. So it's rotating like that, even though the electron is moving all over the place and here, you know, getting scattered off from periods. Now, another you know, way to view the same uh, description, this is what we did, we also generalized this for 2D. This was done previously in, in this paper. You just write down, you know, kinetic equations for the spin chart coupled uh, system, um, and you can see, you know, with all these parameters there. So when you take alpha equals beta, so many of these terms that goes to zero. For instance, b1 goes to zero, b2 goes to zero, c2 goes to zero, and uh, and then so the, the this equations they decouple somehow. For instance, the chart density decouples from say the um, so if you see B1 goes to zero when alpha equals to, to beta. So this disappears. And if I have, uh, say, a uniform distribution along the uh, S direction, you know, I can have that, that also drops out. And eventually enough for the system of interest that, that you know, has been realized experimentally, I, I essentially end up with two coupled equations. Uh, for the, you know, the, the three coupled equations, uh, in fact. Um, so I can actually, imagine I have an initial condition like that. I'll show you how I can generate that uh, in a minute. So imagine I just assume something like that, and in the z direction is some cosine of the q. It's like a Fourier mode that I, uh, I choose, a particular qx. And I inject electrons along the x direction. So ky and so on and zero. So if you do that, you can <coughs> solve this quite simply. You get this uh, two. Uh, uh, you know, it's a double exponential decay, and uh, so uh, you can, uh, and you have these exponentials here that depend on Qx and uh, T and T plus or minus, this would be a plus or minus here. And uh, graphically, what those uh, solutions correspond to are those two modes, actually. The red part here, this times the cosine, so this is a SZ component. So you can see the cosine start to decrease, and the sine is increasing, so it goes like this. 
For the other one, the blue one, it's another configuration, and it starts to spin up, for instance, and then it decreases because it's a minus sign here, so the sign has a different sign, and it goes like that. Now, it turns out, this is for a generic Q. If I tune Q, and I'll tell you how to, to do that experimentally, if I choose Q to be the precise Q with the PSH, then what happens is, I now have capital Q up there, which is this 4M alpha 1, for instance, uh, divided by H square. If I wait long enough, this, uh, uh, first of all, when, when Q is equal to capital Q, this, the, the um, exponential goes to zero, so this is essentially one. And this is just some number, which as time goes on, it decays. So then eventually, this part here, which is the boom part, disappears and you, you, you end up with just the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the red one, the red configuration is the persistent, uh, persistent uh, um, uh, PSH, right? This is spin helix, right? So in the long time limit, I only get the cosine, just like what I showed you before with the quantum mechanical description. Now, uh, this is how people do it experimentally. This is, you know, they create uh, what they call the grating, you know, transient present spin gradient spectroscopy, so you have two incoming beams with orthogonal um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, polarization. And uh, what you, you can see uh, is that because of the selection rules, you essentially absorb um, electron hole, you know, electron hole pairs, you create electron hole pairs in the system on top of the two-dimensional electron gas, which has a profile because you just add those two. In regions of real space, you have absorption, you know, circularly polarized light to, you know, to the left and to the right, and in some regions you have linear polarization. So you eventually, with this configuration, you create a, a density like this, a spin density like that. Um, and of course, uh, in, for this case, uh, the, uh, the system is completely uniform. So it absorbs light uniformly, but there is a modulation in spin. Now it turns out that this, um, the angle between these two uh, lasers uh, actually define Q. So I can tune this to eventually become Q PSH, the Q, uh, the capital Q that I want, the capital Q for which uh, I have this sustained uh, uh, persistent spin. Now it turns out that uh, if you just write this, uh, if you look at this, you know, if you add those two, this is what it is. So if I use a configuration like that, and this is what the experimentalists have done, you essentially generating these two helical patterns I showed you before, and hence one of them will eventually decay, as I showed you. So you should, you should expect to get a double exponential decay, and this is precisely what these guys did a couple of years ago. So you, you have this, some signal here, you do some pump and probe uh, uh, experiment that's in, in this grating, as I showed you before, and you see uh, a nice double decay, and the, the different curves here are for different Q, Qs, right? So uh, uh, they correspond to these two uh, solutions. And if you vary Q by varying the angle, you see that one of them uh, is a long-lived one, and it peaks when this Qx is equal to capital Q. The other one just decays away. So if you're sitting at this Q here, in principle, you have a long, in the scale of uh, you know, nanoseconds here, you have a persistent spin helix. You have this configuration you know, uh, lasting for a long time. This has been imaged in you know, the Zurich group. You know, this is an, 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 another way to do the experiment. Instead of using this transient spin gradient, you just don't care. You don't, don't have you know, this uh, initial laser. What you do is just pump the system with spin polarized um, current, uh, with, a spin, uh, with circularly polarized light. You create a spin-up configuration, and then you, this has all Fourier components. It's a uniform, <laughs> uniform uh, distribution here, and then you just wait. If, in the, if the sample is already tuned to alpha equals beta, what happens is that all the, all the Fourier components will decay, except this magic one for which Q is equal to capital Q, for which Q is the correct Q, the magic Q that gives you the PSA. So you can see here, the formation of this is, you know, only looking at the Z component. So you, you get this, uh, this uh, pattern, which is the persistent uh, spin helix. Now, uh, we have done uh, a uh, detailed calculation for the two-subband uh, system. This is the subject of this talk, right? 
Uh, for gallium arsenide system with uh, two levels in the well, so you have the, uh, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric system. And we have shown that in principle you can have, uh, uh, and this is the important part here, I can uh, have a configuration of it in which alpha 1 is equal to beta 1 for the lowest end, and alpha 2 is equal to minus beta 2 for the second sub-end. That means that in principle you could have a persistent spin helix going uh, along a given direction for the lowest band and an orthogonal persistent spin helix for the other, uh, for the upper subband. I mean, uh, you can look at this uh, plot here. We have all the coupling constants, alpha 1, alpha 2. So alpha 1 is this one here, alpha 2 is this one. Beta 1 and beta 2 essentially don't change much. It's very fairly constant. So, at this point and this point, you can see that I have alpha 1 equals beta 1 and alpha 2 equals minus beta 2. So that means <coughs> sorry, that uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, the system is, uh, is matched in either sub-end, in principle it's possible. So you have this, uh, this Fermi contour that looks like this. And uh, if you now uh, stay away from, say, eventual band crossings, you see we're up there and this is, or down here and so somewhere. This is possible for gallium arsenide. In fact, in gallium arsenide, you're always away, very far away from band crossings. That means that you can neglect the inter band coupling. We actually calculated the influence of inter band coupling in this system. And uh, you can now go through the same argument I had before in a simplistic way. We also did the diffusive approach. And uh, so you have a persistent spin helix. Uh, with the spins rotating around the y direction, say, in the first sub band, and around, around the x direction for the upper band. You can do again the two time evolution operators. Now we have two um, capital Q, one for the first sub band, the other for the, uh, the second sub band. They have opposite signs in this case, right? And then I, I do the evolution, say, for a spin up in the other band. And I end up with something like this for the spinner. Or one, and if I calculate the spin density, I can also do exactly this kind of thing in the presence of disorder. I don't have to assume any form for the wave function. The wave function is not a plane wave here. It's a simplistic argument to see where it comes from on the mechanical. So this is actually the scheme of Landis. I'm going to show you some pictures of it in a second. So I, I have uh, two persistent spin helix that are orthogonal, and I add them currently. Uh, we also have done this uh, semi-classical, you know. Uh, the fused approach, instead of two relaxation times, two decay times, we now have six. In fact, we have eight, but two of them are equal in, within each sub band. So you can check the, uh, the uh, if you're interested in the details, this is all done in, in the supplement, long supplemental uh, material in that paper. Um, and, and here's what we have we have a, a persistent spin in one band, another one on the upper band, and they are orthogonal to each other. If I add the two, I get this, uh, this um, pattern. And you can plot that it looks a bit ugly, but this, uh, it's better to look at it like this, so the lower band and the upper band. If you add the two, you get uh, this picture here. Now, the arrows, they are just the spin um, um, components in plane, in the x-y plane. So this is uh, x and y here in micrometers. And the circles represent this, the uh, the Z component. So here, say the spin, uh, the Z component is pointing up fully, uh, and here it's pointing down. So you can actually define for this configuration uh, the same as we had seen previously in, uh, during this week. You can also define this uh, scheme number. And, uh, so it is uh, really a scheme of lattice uh, of non interacting lag. So there's no interaction here. This, in fact, is uh, just a, a realization, uh, uh, as I can say, of what was called the square spin crystal by uh, Bins and uh, Mishwanath a couple years ago. So this is exactly what we had. So in this paper, they considered this kind of configuration. Right? So x, y are just my uh, q1, x, q2, y, and so on. So you can define the scheme density, you know, map this into the sphere, calculate the magnetization, you see that there, is, there are jumps, you, you know, that, that, that actually defines this um, uh, spirit experiment. Right? So it has a, a quantized um, flux in the presence of Of course, because of symmetry, if you don't have any, what they, we do here, if you calculate this number, 
for a unit cell in real space, it gets zero because it's very symmetric. But then you apply a magnetic field or a magnetization, and you shift this, and you see these jumps here. So, uh, so it is topological. Um, and uh, now, uh, what do we do with this? Uh, so, uh, motivated by this, you know, chiral magnets, what I think is very interesting here is that, in principle, you could uh, imagine. Um, so usually in chiral magnets, what you have is you inject. You inject the current in a like spin polarized current, and the spin follows this texture because of the exchange interaction, which we don't have here. And then eventually, you know, you get something like a topological Hall effect. Uh, but you can also drag the spin, uh, uh, this um, spin lattice. And uh, because you have a time-dependent flux, you end up with an electric field in the, the uh, topological electric field. It's like the electromotive force, right? So the same would happen here. And the, there's some work done in this direction where you can actually drag this persistence that the, uh, the, the uh, persistent uh, uh, spin helix, uh, of course not with the persistent, uh, uh, not with the schema lattice yet, but in principle you can do that and then you, uh, the, the, there will be something like this skirmium hall effect where the lattice would feel this induced electric field because the flux is very and then move sideways. Okay, so um, this is so as uh, you remember from earlier this week, you know, a topological insulator, you can get it by uh, having a gap system. Well, insulator, then somehow you have a knob that makes the, the gap close, and then eventually it crosses, and it opens up again, and you can go through this and calculate the topological invariance and so on. You have to go catch correspondence and, and so on. Now, um, we're so far only mercury and telluride using electron and holes or indium, um, arsenide, indium, and demonide. We had a talk earlier this week by um, uh, Klaus Hensley about the system. There is a couple of proposals here. What we uh, can do in the, in, uh, is, uh, a, uh, and this is, uh, I think, our, um, the only uh, proposal in which there's only electrons in the system. So now I consider the same system I showed you before, but completely symmetric. So I have no Rajman, no Dresser House, just the intercept band coupling eta. So I just rotated the Hamiltonian and wrote it like this. So it's a double well, and it's a 4x4 four four system. It, it resembles a little bit like this VHC model of topological incidents. But of course, this doesn't have any, any gap. So how do we gap the system? Now, to gap the system, what we do is we just add um, a periodic potential like this. So you can poke holes on top of this symbol this double well, and you create this modulation electrically. So just a simple uh, calculation shows that you can have, you know, this is the usual nearly free electron model, you can see the band going up, and eventually because I have a double well, you know, I have uh, crossings up there, and I have band inversion depending on the parameters I have. And the intercept band coupling actually opens up a gap. So I can actually understand that quite simply because I have a double well with just a square lattice. And you can see that if I put them on top of each other, I get the crossing there. And then if I uh, include the periodic potential, I have bracket fractions, and eventually I have these openings of gaps. And if I do a full calculation now, I get an overall gap. And I can control this inversion by changing the gate potential on the super lattice or on this anti-dot lattice that I have on top of the two deck. And uh, we can go on and calculate, um, for instance, the topological index and so on, uh, and also calculate edge states um, and, uh, and all features uh, that we, uh, we usually find in, uh, in the topological insulators in 2D. The, the, the crucial difference here is that this is an ordinary 3-5 semiconductor with just electrons. So there's no holes or anything like that. Okay, uh, with that, I think I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a very insightful talk. So in the first few slides, we have this very nice discussion of Rajba interaction. So like 10, 15 years ago, there was this uh, debate that, you know, Rajba interaction is actually zero, yeah. naively, because of the theory. So maybe it's advantages for students to emphasize in your equations how you bypass the yeah. yeah. steering from projection into the stationary states along the z-axis. Yeah. Well, it's actually, that's why I said the argument I presented simply is wrong. Because any expectation value of a bound state is zero. Some people call this the undo 
objection, as you correctly said, you know, we heard it, I don't know, some 20 years ago. So <clears throat> the point is, it's actually wrong to say that the Raja interaction is proportional to the electric field. That's as we just showed that, right, in that first slide. But then, of course, when you do k dot p, you can see that alpha is actually a sum of three different terms, which are not just directly, you cannot just write the whole thing as proportional to the electric, the total electric field. So, some, in, in fact, if my computer had not frozen, I would go back and uh, show you that uh, the, this slide uh, where I, I, I showed the calculated alpha for the experiments in Dominic's lab, where you have the several contributions. Some of them cancel each other, so you can have partial you know, cancellation of the heart rate and the... And the so, there's no paradox. It's just like the wrong uh, assumption to say that it's proportional to the electric field. Because then, of course, if you take the expectation value of the electric field in the hydrogen atom, you get zero. Because in any bound state. So this is one point. The other point is, uh, which you can also get away with, is that saying that uh, when you have a heterostructure, the mass, the effective mass is different in the well and in the barriers. So in fact, the total electric field is actually a sum, because have this continuity now, and, and this has been studied by uh, Zapatsky and company. And you can show that you have a force that actually coming from this difference in the mass. It's the total that is zero. So you also have some contribution even from the electric field. But in your equations, so which argument is then stronger? Like the, the standard argument from Winkler's book is that there is electric field from the balance band, which is affecting the That's right. Yeah, this that's is what you have in yeah. there. Yeah. And this is there. And there is Zavatsky's argument about effective mass. So which one is actually the the, the, you know, the, the, usual, the one I showed you is in line with uh, what Winkler writes in the book, and you could see that my alpha and my eta and all these constants, they actually have only the valence band offsets in them. That's one way to say that the uh, spin-orbit interaction is actually coming from the valence band. More questions? Exactly. Excuse me. Uh, what's the problem <coughs> is uh, working with holes? Because in holes we also can have intersections of different subbands and. Uh, sure, there's no problem working with holes. In fact, I encourage anyone, you know, I always avoid them because I find them, you know, it's more complicated, but you can do exactly the same thing I did and focus on the whole sector. Right? And you can quantize it. Now. It's actually <coughs> even more interesting to some extent because. The spin orbit for holes is, you know, can be larger, you know, yeah, but it's, it's the same same idea. And in fact, there is a proposal already by uh, Andre and collaborators for a persistent spin helix for holes. And uh, another property is that you work with higher wave vectors. S say that again? Uh, you, you have intersections of bigger wave vectors. So yes. it's a uh, smaller uh, spatial scale. Yeah. Questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, and uh, about estimation of uh, this helix uh, period, uh, is it uh, for some real parameters of Rajba constant? Is it uh, 80 nanometers? Yeah, oh, like on this. Okay, for this, for, uh, this is for the topological insulator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the persistence with helix, everything we did in, 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 in the, in, is based on the the same values that they used experimentally for gallium arsenide. So this could be like 100 nanometers. You know, oh, 100 nanometers. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any urgent questions? If not, then let's send the speaker again. One minute to say one thing that I, I forgot to mention because my computer froze. It's the fact that um, me, um, our very own Yaroslav, the not so wise yet, uh, and Alan McDonald and Daniel Laws are organizing a nice conference in the northern part of Brazil uh, next year, uh, between April 24 and May 26. It's one of his extended programs. So up there we have an institute um, which is, has sort of the same philosophy as the Cavalier Institute in Santa Barbara, where you know they organize extended programs. So this one is. Um, uh, um, transport in uh, electrical insulators. So this is very broad. 
uh, subject. Many of you already probably received emails about it. And uh, uh, so it's going to cover a whole range of topics just like the ones covered in this conference. So I invite you all to keep an eye on that. And um, um, I'll try to uh, send, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the link. So perhaps you can uh, distribute it uh, among the participants. And I welcome you to check the website. It's a very nice uh, area. In the, it's called Natal in the northern part of Brazil. So please plan to attend. Thank you very much.